Terrorism expert, I say, you mean you teach terrorism? And I don't know. No one laughs. So, so uh, the, que the question I was asked to speak about was continuity and change in, in the Islamic legal tradition, in the Sharia tradition. And uh, this is actually a very interesting topic and very important because when you look at the issue of continuity and change. To what extent does something remain the same? To what extent does it undergo some kind of transformation? You, you study this throughout time, what it tells you is what a thing inherently is. Okay, so <coughs> if you are able to analyze and identify all the changes and identify what stays the same, well, that stuff that stays the same usually will inform you what the part of the inherent nature of that thing. And the nature of the changes also can be constant. You can always have certain kinds of changes, and then you know that those kinds of changes are also inherently part of that thing. Study of continuity and change also allows us to see what a thing has been, what it can be in the future, and what it maybe can't be in the future. So when we look at the continuity and change in the context of Islamic law, Sharia, this is very important considering the angst over, you know, the angsting by almost every sector of American public and government on Sharia in America, Sharia in Muslim countries, and because no one seems to actually be able to present a clear idea of what the Sharia is or what it necessarily has to be any place that it's implemented. Now, um, first question, what is the Sharia? I think most people here know what it is, but I'll define it anyway. The Sharia in general is the idea of God's law, the idea of God's law. Now what I mean when I say idea or ideal, it's important that we distinguish it from the actual attempts by Muslims to understand this law in a implementable or real temporal form. So the Sharia is the idea of God's law, the idea of what God wants from people, how he wants them to worship, what he sees is for forbidden to, for them. What is required of them in their actions? How should they interact with each other? How should their manners be? Right? This is the idea of God's law. How is it actually implemented or understood through the work of Muslim jurists, ulama or fuqaha, jurists, in the elaboration of the fiqh tradition or the jurisprudential tradition? And you can't go to you can't go to a library or a bookstore and say, "Oh, I'm really interested in the Sharia. Could you just give me the, the Sharia book, please?" You know, yeah, you know, the, like the California Penal Code, and there's, you know, a state of Missouri divorce law or something like that. You go and they give you some books that tells you a law about divorce and marriage in Missouri. There's no book of Sharia. There's no book of Sharia. But there are the thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of books and volumes written by Muslim scholars from Morocco to Southeast Asia from the year 710 to today on how they understand what God's law should be on any one topic. And of course, there's a tremendous diversity of opinions because any time any person or any group of people or, any, or somebody in any one place or another place in one century as opposed to another century, any time they try and understand something as, you know, in sense inscrutable as what God wants from us, you will necessarily get different answers. So there's a tremendous diversity of opinion within the Sharia tradition. Now, uh, when we talk about the Sharia, we also have to ask ourselves what we mean by law. Okay, so a lot of people say that Sharia is Islamic law. So let's say Sharia is the idea of Islamic law. Let's say fiqh is a concrete attempt to understand what that law would be. What do we mean by law? Now in America, we think about law as being either the interaction between the individual and the state on issues of requirement or prohibition, or the issue interaction between individuals, two individuals, in a conflict before the state, that the state is adjudicated. So if I, you know, when I was a kid there was a show called People's Court. I don't know if People's Court is still on TV. Now there's Judge Judy. I don't even know if Judge Judy is still on TV. All these, all these shows where someone comes in and says, you know, 
he stole my car, he, you know, used my blender and broke it, and the, the judge Judy adjudicates that. Okay, those are two individuals. When you watch a trial, like the, when I was a kid, there was the OJ, OJ trial, that's the state holding somebody accountable or attempting to hold somebody accountable for an act that is seen as a violation of the law. So that's what we think about when we think about the law. And most of us, God willing, really don't have much interaction with the law in that sense. Um, think about your daily life and how often you actually interact with the law. Okay, well, you interact with traffic laws and parking meters and things like that, but you don't, you know, we don't usually think about going to court or being sued by somebody else as part of our daily life. Most of our interactions with other people are governed by what we would consider in the United States so, uh, culture, cultural norms. Um, you know, what should you, you know, when your friend calls up and says, I can't believe it, you know, Timmy, uh, sorry, Timmy, you know, uh, Sophia, you know, borrowed my uh, Tupperware and then she returned it, but it was all dirty and it's really ruined. I don't think I can use it again. And what a mean thing to do. And I can't believe she did that, et cetera, et cetera. This is because there's an understanding of how you interact when you borrow something and you can return it in a good condition. This is not um, law for us. This is just culture. Now, the Sharia would include all of these things. So the Sharia includes what we would consider law, right? Um, things like uh, punishments for murder, punishments for theft, right? It would include things like taxation, uh, contract <coughs> law, uh, mar marriage law, divorce law, inheritance law, etc., etc. But the bulk of Sharia, if you looked at a book of, if you looked at a book of, let's say, the, the jurisprudence of the Shafi school of law, most of the, the pages of that book, you're going to take a sort of a measurement about what volume of the book is devoted to what. Most of it is going to be devoted to things that have nothing to do with what Americans think about law. It's going to be about how you pray, how you do your wudu, how you perform your ablutions, how do you um, uh, do hajj, how do you do your fasting, how do you interact with people, how are you supposed to treat your parents, how are you supposed to treat other people, um, what are the things that Muslims have to believe, what are the things that Muslims don't have to believe, and these have nothing to do with what we think about as law in America, but they're part of Islamic law. They also, also in America, when we think about law, we think about you have to do this or you, you weren't allowed to do that. You weren't allowed to do this and you did this and now you're going to be punished. Or you, weren't, you had to do this and you didn't do this and now you're going to be punished. Okay? Through some means, either financial or, or through time in prison. Now, in, if you again, if we imagine this book of, let's say, the fifth from the Shafi school, the vast majority of cases, just points of issue in this book, are not going to have a ruling that says this is required or forbidden. It's going to be this is recommended or this is discouraged, or this is slightly recommended or slightly discouraged or very recommended or very discouraged. So this is much more about uh, the kind of the shades of gray of people's interactions. The shades of gray about how they're supposed to pray or do their fasting or do their hajj. Which is again something that we're not used to when we think about law in American context. Right? So, how did it come about that you have the Sharia, this thing I just described? How is it that you, you, you Muslims develop this idea of God's law that covers every area of human behavior and isn't just about what you have to do or just can't do, but it's also about these shades of gray of discouraged and, and encouraged, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, well, I want you to imagine something. Now, when we think about, and people in America think about Sharia, they think about it as this other legal system that, for some reason, we still don't understand, just, people want it to exist next to another perfectly good legal system. Right? You know, why would I need Sharia law when I have all the laws of the United States and the various states and American culture, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we have to imagine, imagine that there is no system. Imagine there is no law. Imagine there are no traffic laws. Imagine there are no taxation laws. Imagine, in fact, there are no real social norms that everybody can agree on. Somebody is going to have to create those things. Somebody is going to have to create those things. And actually, this is really the situation in which Muslims found themselves when they left Arabia in around the year 634 and started expanding out into first the Middle East, 
then North Africa into Central Asia, right? In the year 711, the Muslims conquer what's now in Spain, the Iberian Peninsula. The same year in 711, they conquer Sindh in what's now Pakistan. Right? By 650, they're in Marv in Uzbekistan. In, uh, in their, uh, by uh, 750, 758, Muslim merchants are setting up camp in, in, in Canton near what's now Hong Kong in China. Right? Muslims suddenly find themselves living by the way, is a very small minority in a expanse of territory from Spain to Central Asia, from Spain to India. Now, what, 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 what do Muslims realize? They realize something very important, which we, we also should keep in mind, which is, guess what? People disagree. And what one city or one country thinks is the way that things should be, another country thinks is completely ridiculous. What one tribe thinks is the way things should be and how we should act is totally the opposite from what another tribe thinks. And you can't count on custom, on culture, or even on local notions of law to create any kind of unified vision of how Muslims should live. Now at first, Muslims, they don't really worry about this too much because they were also very localized. So Muslims growing up, let's say, in the late 600s, the generation of the companions, the generation after the generation of the prophets' followers in the late 600s and the early 700s of the common era, they're living in Kufa and Basra in southern Iraq, and they have their teachings that they've inherited from the prophet and the prophet's companions, and they have the Quran, and they have their scholars, and they have the local ways of the people who've been living there, and they kind of come up with a way of how they should understand religion. How do they pray? How do they do their ablutions? How do they buy and sell things? And that's great. But then guess what happens? Someone from there travels to another Muslim to go to Damascus. Or someone from Damascus goes to Egypt. Or someone from Egypt goes to Yemen. And they discover, oh my gosh, the Muslims in Yemen think that the way Muslims should act is totally different from the way they, act, they think it is uh, in, let's say, Azerbaijan. And you have to remember, there's this tremendous will to unity in the early Muslim community, as there is today, by the way. There's this idea that Muslims should agree. They should have one way of thinking about their religion. They might disagree on details, but they should at least be trying to have a unified vision. So scholars like, everyone's heard of Imam al-Shafi'i, Muhammad ibn uh, Idris al-Shafi'i, he died in the 20 of the Common Era, originally he's from, he was born in Gaza, he grew up in the, near Mecca and Medina. He, spent time as a governor in Yemen, he traveled, spent time in Baghdad, he went, lived in Egypt, he died in Egypt where he's buried. And one of the things actually that his life shows us is that's, that's, this is what he noticed. He said, we cannot base our understanding of law, of what God wants from us, on local solutions. There has to be a universal solution. And that's the idea of using the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet and the opinions of the early jurists and the, the, the general opinions of Muslim scholars in one school of law to come up with a unified vision of what the Sharia should be. And of course, you're never going to have one unified vision. What you're going to have is a group of schools, of a number of, of positions, a number of traditions that grow up in different areas, and that solidify in those areas. And that's where you have the Medhebs, the Sunni and the Shiite schools of law, which generally tend to you know, be fixed in certain areas. Hanafi traditions throughout South Asia, almost all of South Asia. The Shafi tradition, all of Southeast Asia. The Maliki tradition, all of North, of North Africa, into uh, West Africa. So, the, 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 this Sharia tradition was a solution to the fact that there was no code of law. There was no code of conduct that could join the Muslims. They had to come up with one, some way. And that was the Sharia tradition. And what better way for a group of people who claim to be the followers of God's last prophet, who claim to be devoted to serving the message of the Quran, than to look to the Quran and their records of the prophet's words and deeds as the primary sources for how you understand how you should act what you should believe. Okay. Well, what about, what else did the Sharia bring to areas in which Muslims lived and, and visited and settled? Now, this is going to sound very polit politically incorrect. I don't know, maybe it is. But I'll say it anyway, because I think 
there is something to it. I'll, I'll stick my neck out there. The Sharia brought, actually brought a lot of quote unquote civilization to many areas. Okay? Well, again, we tend to think about you know, a country or a society or a community <laughs> having some set of laws. You, know, you don't visit any state in America, at least not that I know of, maybe some states. You don't visit any state in America and there's no law. You just, everyone's driving around in Humvees with machine guns in the back, saying, you know, and the people have like, you know, mohawks and rubber tire body armor and things like that. People who've watched Mad Max will know what I'm talking about. You don't, you don't ever, there's always law. There's always law and order. There's always agreement. There's always a way of dealing with, with conflict. But sometimes there are societies and places where they don't have this. They don't have this. Okay? Now, we have, let's take an example of, um, let's say, Central Asia and North India in the late 1200s and early 1300s. Now, people living in, let's say, a village in North India, they have their way of doing things. Okay, and that's fine. They have their local religion, they have local customs. But then suddenly, this Turkish warlord, who's basically a glorified bandit, he's a Turkish warrior, he's got a bunch of Turkic warrior buddies, they've got horses, they've got bows and arrows, and they think it's just the best thing in the world to go and raid these little villages, and take whatever they can, and eventually they settle down in one of these villages in northern <coughs> India, and they actually start little state. They start taxing people, and they say, I'm the, I'm the sultan, I'm the ruler of this area. But guess what? That Turkish ruler has no idea what law is. He has no idea how to deal with disputes with the people among, underneath him, let alone with his own Turkish warrior buddies. So what does he, there, there's no law for him. What does he do? He's got Turkish tradition, Turkic tradition, okay? What you find is these warriors who settled in northern India in the, in the early, late 1200s and early 1300s of the Common Era, part of what came known as the Delhi Sultanate, they were desperate for Muslim scholars to come who could use the Sharia, who could teach, set up Sharia courts that could actually be used for adjudicating disputes. And if you ever want to read good book, a great book about this, you can read the translation of Ibn Battuta's Travels, which is translated in um, about three volumes. It's a very fun book to read. You can read about a Moroccan scholar who traveled throughout the Muslim world, West Africa, India, Central Asia, Europe, China. And everywhere he'd go, he worked as a Sharia court judge because everybody needed him. Sometimes there is no law in the sense in, in some of the senses that we think about law. And the Sharia provided that in the Muslim world. It was the glue, it was one of the glues that held together Islamic civilization. It's one of the things that made Islamic civilization a civilization, a unit you could look at on a map. You can study as a as a body. Another thing when I, when I say Sharia actually brought civilization to many areas is that some law codes, and I, I, I don't have a problem, sometimes my wife will always tell me, you're so, insert negative adjective here, when you say these kind of things. But I, I do say, I'm, I'm willing to evaluate certain cultures and certain ways of life and say, this way, this culture, this way of life is better than another culture, another way of life. I don't have a problem doing that. Sometimes people get mad at me. But I will say this, some of the law codes that the Sharia replaced or positively influenced, I think were egregiously cruel and inhumane. So, for example, there's a great, uh, there's a great uh, Indian scholar, actually, who moved to Southeast Asia to what's now the, the country of Indonesia, in Aceh. And one of the things, he actually was one of the first real Muslim scholars to settle there in, I think, the early 1600s. And one of the things he was very happy about, he was very proud of this, is he got the Sultan of Aceh, he later took on the name Sultan, he became Muslim, uh, or he was Muslim, actually started being more attentive to his religion. He actually got this sultan to stop boiling thieves in oil. Thieves? Thieves. People. People who, who stole things. Indonesians have great food. I love Indonesian food. They boil a lot of stuff in oil. Apparently, at some point, they were boiling people who were criminals in oil as their money. So Nuruddin Raniere came and said, listen, you're Muslim, right? Okay, fine. Boiling in oil is not an acceptable punishment. So he, he, he was very happy about this. 
and I think he was justifiably pleased with himself. If we look at, and I was very surprised about this, when I was a teacher at University of Washington, there was an Afghan law program there, so you have actually uh, Afghan legal scholars at the UW Law School every year. And I would talk to these scholars, and some of them were not um, uh, specialists in Islamic law, they were specialists in uh, Jirga law, in basically local uh, Afghan, usually Pashtun um, tribal law, which is called, sometimes called Pashtun Wali. Now Pashtun Wali has some very good attributes, for example, hospitality, Take, uh, giving protection to somebody who seeks protection. There's also some parts of Pashtun Wali which are, I think, unacceptable. For example, if you, if somebody comes and uh, kills somebody in my family, well, I'll get that person's sister as my slave, or my wife, or whatever. My female subservient. Now, that's uh, in certain circumstances, not in all circumstances. But my point is, I think that is unacceptable. The idea that somebody commits a crime, and yet another person suffers for that crime. Another person has to pay the punishment. An innocent person, a woman here, has to suffer because of, of the, the crime of one of her male kin. That's unacceptable. And the Sharia law, for everybody's, everybody has lots of criticisms about the Sharia. But one thing it does say, very clearly, is that the person who commits a crime is responsible for bearing the punishment of that crime. There's a few exceptions to this. For example, uh, if uh, somebody injures another person or kills another person, sometimes that person's whole family has to get together to pay the, the blood money. Or if, um, if, I have a, if I have a slave and that slave goes and knocks some guy's eye out, uh, the slave doesn't have any money. I am the master, I have to pay for the, the, the injury damage that's been done to this person. But in general, the position is that you are responsible for crime duty. Nobody else, and certainly not an innocent person. Well, someone might say, you just talked about how the Sharia <coughs> is a civilizing force or a positive force in history. Well, what about these Hadood punishments? What about people getting their hands chopped off? And you know, anytime you watch a movie about the Islamic world of the Middle East, inevitably someone will get stoned. The person, the hero, will walk into a city and Coincidentally, somebody's going to get stoned and get their hand chopped off, usually within five or three years or something like that. Any movie you'll always show this. What about all that awful stuff? Well, here we have to think about what the purpose of the Hadood are. The Hadood are the uh, sort of severe corporal or capital punishments mentioned in the Quran and many things like stoning an adulterer or uh, cutting off the hand of a thief. Right? What you see in actual understanding of Islamic law, as understood by jurists, is that these punishments are almost impossible to carry out. For example, in order to, uh, the Quran says, the thief, male or female thief, if they steal something, uh,